Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show the most common and generally preferred method for measuring a transfer function. And that method is based on computing a cross spectrum and dividing it by an auto spectrum. So in this model, we've got a device under test, which is a continuous timer analog notch filter. And I'm going to be measuring both the band limited uh, excitation or input to it. And I'm also going to be measuring a measurement noise corrupted output from the device under test. So I have this two channel measurement. In the middle of the diagram, you'll see we have a very uh, symmetrical set of blocks uh, equivalent between the reference and response channel. But you'll see right in the middle, you'll see where we perform that auto spectrum and cross spectrum computation. Uh, on bottom, you see the cross spectrum at this product for a vector multiply block. And then the auto spectrum is at the top. Uh, using this product three vector multiply block. So on bottom, we have the cross spectrum between the conjugate of the reference spectrum and the response spectrum. And then on top, we have essentially, you could say the cross spectrum of the reference uh, signal with itself, or it's the conjugate, uh, the, the reference spectrum with the conjugate um, of that reference spectrum. We compute the uh, product of it. And that forms our auto spectrum estimate. So what we're going to see at, that this is a very robust measurement approach uh, when we are in, in the presence of measurement noise, when our measurement is corrupted um, by an additional source of noise. OK, so let's go ahead and step through the model quickly in this video. This is going to be a more brief introduction uh, to uh, this measurement approach and of course we'll run it and we'll see the uh the results and then in a follow-up video what we'll do is go over uh the measurement approach in more detail be more details on the signal processing and also on different what if scenarios we'll cover those uh, separately as well okay so we have this device under test its output again well it, it is excited by band limited gaussian noise uh, the device under test has a notch at one kilohertz it's a through filter otherwise in fact you could just say, well, here's its response on top. It's this magnitude response and phase response. This all pre-computed in MATLAB. And so that's all analytical. Now we have this same block in Simulink. You could assume it's a mystery block, although in this case, we know what the right answer is uh, before we start. It's a well-controlled experiment. Uh, it's excited by uh, band-limited Gaussian noise, band-limited out to 10 kilohertz. And it's going to be the measurement side will be corrupted by Gaussian, band limited Gaussian noise, band limited out to 100 kilohertz. Okay, so that sum forms our response channel input, and then just the band limited Gaussian excitation forms the reference channel input. Again, two channel measurement is the preferred approach, uh, just as it would be consistent with the definition of a transfer function, which is a Y of S over U of S definition, uh, output over input. Okay, so the signal processing is very symmetric, so we could just kind of go along the top path, the reference path. The first thing we do in each path is we low pass filter or we analog anti-alias filter, okay? Then we sample. And of course, these two are related. We wanna make sure we set that sample rate in alignment with the, uh, the cutoff frequency of our uh, analog anti-alias filter. Then we buffer up so many samples and the buffering of course is because we're gonna be doing buffered or vectored operations to follow like windowing and F15. Okay, same, good. We do that same thing on, on both reference and response. Then we hand, hand window, we FFT, and then we take a subset of our FFT output. Again, our signal is real, so we can take advantage of the fact uh, that our spectrum is conjugate symmetric and to avoid processing the entire FFT, FFT output. So we take that pruned FFT output, those two pruned or reduced spectrums, and we compute the auto spectrum and the cross spectrums, okay, as spoken of earlier. And without going into more detail right now, the essential function these provide is on the bottom, at least the cross spectrum. And this is really the key junction in the whole model. If you had to pick one block where all the action is, it's product floor, product four here is shown. Uh, the cross spectrum is essentially uh, reducing or minimizing the effect of the measurement noise on the overall magnitude and phase response estimates. Okay, because the since the response is corrupted and there's contributions at this point from the measurement noise. There's also the desired uh, contribution that we want to study from the excitation. We want to be able to separate them. And this product block is the, the great separator in, in this model. 
uh, it's not the it's not the spectral averaging. It's not the F15 or the window and anywhere else. It's just this product block right here. All right, so we compute that cross spectrum. We also compute the auto spectrum. The auto spectrum serves as the great normalizer in the model. So everything is now measured with respect to or referenced against via the uh, the divide operator with respect to the auto spectrum. And so that corrects for a lot of other, uh, shall we say, issues in the model that you might run into, like um, anti-alias filter imperfections, um, sample time effects, uh, other, yeah, other effects that can be introduced um, uh, by the other signal processing in the model. So that kind of ratios that out of the system. And then we break up that complex frequency response estimate at this node. Uh, you could call it H of S, although in this case, it's in discrete time H of Z. Uh, we break it up into its magnitude and phase components and we display it on our two spectrum analyzer windows. So let's go ahead and run the model and we'll view again the magnitude response on top, phase response on bottom, overlaid, if we look, go back to our model again with the theoretical predictions that we computed in MATLAB, the magnitude and phase vectors here. So let's go ahead and put those back up. And what we'll see is we get, uh, well, it looks like a single waveform or single uh, curve in each case. Um, you know, magnitude response here against theory and phase response against theory. But if we zoom in, we will see that there are indeed two curves uh, present. And we can now start to see some small deviation or noise on the magnitude response estimate around that theoretical trend line. Similar story down here for the phase response. It's a very low noise phase response measurement against that theoretical phase uh, curve or theoretical phase trend line there. Okay, so that is uh, at least how it performed, which is quite well for one uh, particular measurement scenario. And specifically for one type of you know noise distribution, uh, bandwidth limited and particular gain that we added into our uh, device under test output. Of course, we could always play with these numbers and see you know the sensitivity uh, to those different changes. We can also just get a feel for it by using a scope, which is always handy to have a scope in your model just to get a relative feel for how much, how big the noise is compared to our device under test output in blue here without noise. So you can see yellow is the noise, device under test output is blue. And these are the two signals we sum to form our response channel input at this node in our system. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there for our introduction to the cross-spectrum to auto-spectrum measurement um, approach. In a follow-on video, I want to go into the signal processing uh, in more detail uh, for the excitation uh, and for all the downstream signal processing thereof, uh, more specifically, more detail on the auto-spectrum and cross-spectrum approach. Okay, until then, thanks for tuning in.